All right, hello everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining the COVID-19 Public Health Action Webinar, Economic Relief Through the CARES Act. My name is Steph Moyer and I'm the Community Initiatives and Training Coordinator for the Hawaii Public Health Institute. Before we get started, there's some Zoom housekeeping to go over. For all questions, please utilize the chat box or question and answers box located at the bottom of your screen. We will not be offering continuing education credits for this webinar series. All webinars are being recorded and will be available through the Hawaii Public Health Training Hui's YouTube channel. Our moderator for today is Trish Lachika, HiFi's Policy Director. It's my honor to first introduce you to our guest speakers today. Brian Schatz is Hawaii's senior United States Senator. He serves on the Senate Appropriations Committee, the Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee, the Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee, the Indian Affairs Committee, and the Select Committee on Ethics. Senator Schatz also chairs the Special Committee on the Climate Crisis and serves on the Senate Democratic Caucus's leadership team as Chief Deputy Whip. Our second speaker today is Kathleen Allgaier, Director of Public Policy and Research for the Hawaii Children's Action Network. Kathleen is the Director of Public Policy and Research. In her role, she advocates for children and families at the city, county, and state level with a focus on healthy families. Before joining HCAN, she worked on issues impacting justice-involved women and economic and fiscal policies in Hawaii and Maryland. Ms. Allgaier received her MSW from Columbia University. I am happy to turn it over to Trish now to moderate today's webinar. Thank you, Steph, um, and thank you, everyone. Thank you to our speakers for joining us today. Um, we've been hosting these weekly webinars um, since the pandemic, um, at least a month ago. And just, it's so important, you know, during this time to give um, our public up-to-date um, information. And I'm excited, you know, to be able to talk about the resources that are coming into the state, but also the relief that's available because, you know, the pandemic has really threatened our way of life. So many parents, families are forced to make um, very strug you know, are struggling and are forced to make decisions that have impacted um, them financially as well. So we're going to be talking about um, not just the CARE Act, CARES Act, but also just the various um, packages that have been signed into law and also the relief that's coming into the state. And Senator Schatz will only be with us for about a half hour today, so he's not going to be able to take direct questions, but if you do have questions for him, we are, our staff um, will be tracking that through the chat box or the Q&A box, and we'll be working with his office to um, answer those questions as follow-up and then um, be able to share that back with our participants today. So um, with that said, um, welcome Senator Schatz. I think um, if you can give us kind of just a brief overview of the three packages um, to date um, and the fe federal response um, to co the coronavirus. Sure, thank you. And thank you for having me. I really appreciate the good work that you're all doing. Um, let me just start with a summary of where we are with the CARES Act. Um, the first thing that's happening this week is that the cash payments are going out. Um, that is a, a good thing. Um, most of anyone who has an ACH, an electronic relationship with the IRS, uh, should get that money hitting their account um, this week. Uh, the checks are delayed and will be issued uh, about 5 million checks per week until they are done. So um, if you are still eligible, and do not have an ACH relationship with the IRS, um, then you may be waiting uh, a little while longer. Please go to either irs.gov or shots.senate.gov because it's not too late for you to sign up for a direct deposit relationship. The website right now, frankly, is really glitchy, but it's worth doing so that you don't have to uh, wait for a check uh, in the mail. A couple of other uh, updates, the uh, Paycheck Protection Program, which is a small business lending uh, program, looks to be, on the one hand, uh, relatively successful in the sense that somewhere between uh, uh, $1.5 billion and $2 billion worth of loans uh, have been provided to Hawaii small businesses. 
Um, and, you know, to call it a loan is a little bit misleading because it's really a loan uh, for eight weeks. And as long as you uh, use those dollars to keep your payroll, uh, then that loan is forgiven at the end of the eight weeks and sort of gets converted to a grant. So somewhere between a billion and a half and two billion dollars uh, to keep everybody employed in the state of Hawaii. That's the good news. The bad news is that that's probably meeting 30 to 40 percent of the need. And so um, we want to fix the way this program is working administratively. There have been holdups at the SBA level uh, and some technical snafus, which is um, uh, really unfortunate, but somewhat understandable for an agency that normally only pushes out 10 billion. Suddenly they're pushing out 370 billion uh, in a two week period. But we got to fix those glitches. And then it's, it's also just got to get another tranche uh, of appropriation so that we can continue to uh, help people to maintain their payroll. The unemployment insurance piece of the CARES Act um, is the largest expansion of unemployment insurance uh, in many, many decades. Um, it is relatively generous. It is designed to be generous uh, to make sure that people are able to stay financially whole during uh, this difficult period. The challenge we are having uh, is the throughput capacity of the State Department of Labor and Industrial Relations uh, Office. Uh, we understand there are lots of uh, non-Department of Labor employees who would like to help. Uh, and so we're pushing the Department of Labor to sort of uh, ramp up their capacity to be able to take phone calls, to make sure the website works, and to push these checks out because speed is key. Uh, there are people uh, for uh, many, uh, many people uh, uh, who are going to need to pay the rent or the mortgage uh, very, very quickly, and they are running out of money if they haven't already run out of money. We understand this is an unprecedented situation uh, and don't want to get into a blame game, but suffice it to say that we are spending uh, many hours every day and every week uh, trying to make sure that the Department of Labor has the capability to push those dollars out. Um, three more things uh, before I get, it in, uh, get into questions. Uh, there is hospital money. We don't think it's enough, um, but it's a start. Um, uh, the first tranche of hospital money went out on the basis of Medicare spending, um, which sort of is disadvantageous for the state of Hawaii because we have a lot of dual eligibles and a lot of Medicare Advantage uh, participants. So we're hoping that we can negotiate with the administration and other states to make sure that the remainder of the money is distributed on a more equitable uh, basis. And then lots of hospitals and other Medicare providers actually got an advance on future Medicare billings. That is not a grant, but that certainly helps with uh, any short-term cash flow issues. Um, the last uh, thing I wanna mention uh, is that we know $1.25 billion came for the state of Hawaii and the city and county of Honolulu. Um, and that was relatively uh, restrictive in terms of the allowable uses of those dollars. Uh, it was designed to address the COVID price, uh, crisis directly, either economically or in healthcare terms, but not to fill a budget hole that either the state or one of the counties are experiencing. Um, in the next negotiation, uh, Leader Schumer, Speaker Pelosi, uh, myself and many other Democrats are really prioritizing state and county fiscal stabilization. Um, and uh, the National Governors Association on a unanimous bipartisan basis just asked the Congress to basically do a fiscal bailout for the states and the counties because it is hard to imagine the economy recovering, even in the most optimistic scenario uh, in terms of the uh, virus itself. And I'm not uh, assuming the most optimistic scenario, but even if that were the case, uh, if at the same time that things are improving in terms of the healthcare, that you end up closing firehouses and not being able to pay teachers and nurses and, and, and cleaners and transportation workers, uh, it just makes no sense. So we are fighting really hard uh, to be able to uh, avoid uh, layoffs and furloughs. Um, it is unwise for me to promise federal money because I don't know. We still have to do a negotiation with Mitch McConnell and, and, and President Trump. But suffice it to say that nothing will pass um, without the speaker and Chuck Schumer having their uh, policy imprint on it. And one of our highest priorities is to bring in some, some funds to just stabilize the fiscal situation for the state, primarily the state, but also the counties. Thank you. Thank you for that um, great summary um, and update, Senator. I think 
um, a lot of the folks who are on the webinar today, um, and I think we're gonna uh, about 500 or so folks, um, a lot of us are working um, on the state level, right? There's folks who are healthcare providers, there's folks who work directly on social services, um, just making sure that we have the capacity and we are continuing to address the needs of, of Hawaii's residents and families. And we, with the, with the resources that are coming in, um, we are also experiencing the same type of operational challenges that Department of Labor at the federal level is experiencing. And I know folks have had, um, have been struggling too here at the state. Can you talk a little bit about, um, I guess for no, the first is for healthcare providers, we're seeing um, some clinical um, offices that are also shutting down because they're unable to bill or they're not prepared or set up for telehealth. But um, what type of um, assistance is there for them who, um, and um, how can they use that to make sure that they can continue to provide um, coverage? Well, my best suggestion there, because it'll differ from provider to provider and institution uh, to institution, um, is to contact our office or go to shots.senate.gov. And just so you know, when you fill out that form, it is not a black hole. Sometimes I get nervous, you know, typing my name into a web form wondering whether any human will ever read it. We have a team of people who actually read these things. So please use that as a sort of portal to come in and help uh, and allow us to help to guide you um, through where those resources may be available. I'll also add that the $860 million that is Lance Coffers, um, they have a, a basic idea of how they want to spend it. But to the extent that there are specific needs um, in your community, it is worth gathering those, reducing it to writing, and sending it to both legislative leaders and, and the governor himself, uh, because they are still in the process of coming up with a spending plan. I think the basic principles behind the spending plan are already established, which is to say, we're kind of mandatorily shutting down the economy, so we want to make sure food, shelter, uh, and healthcare are the priorities. But what that looks like exactly um, I think uh, remains to be seen. And I'll just add one additional thing. The more money we can push out to smaller agencies, smaller providers, the quicker it will see, it will be turned into action and positive things in the community. We don't want all of this to get hung up. And then we learn that, you know, half of the CARES Act money took 18 months to spend. We had that problem with the ARA funds, with the stimulus funds under President Obama, where some of these dollars, you know, took four years to spend. The purpose here, because it's such a precipitous drop, is to push the money out uh, almost instantaneously, and you can help us with that. Thank you. So what you're saying, Senator, is for the um, 1.25 billion coming in, like those parameters aren't set kind of in stone yet, although a chunk, big chunk of it should go to food, shelter, um, healthcare, and you know PPE stuff, but um, we the community, does have an opportunity to weigh in and help kind of provide recommendations on the critical needs that need to be um, funded. Absolutely, and because this is really a, a sort of a disaster management situation, it's important for, for uh, decision makers to hear about unmet needs. You know, lots of really smart people on conference calls are trying to decide how to spend this money, but we need to hear from people who are on the front lines in terms of how things are actually going. Um, so. Um, let let bad news uh, travel fast, if you will, and and let the state leaders know how you think this money should be spent. You can CC me, but my job was to get the money, not to expend the money. Right, right, right. Um, do you have a sense of the timeline on when these funds ha will be coming into Hawaii? At the latest, April 24, uh, 26th, uh, that's their actual statutory deadline, but we anticipate they're going to hit... Um, uh, accounts probably uh, within the week. Okay, thank you. So let's move on to assistance for, um, as you, you talked about the Paycheck Protection Program, but assistance available for small businesses and nonprofits. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how can we, um, what, what should um, our community do to be able to access those funds to continue um, operating? Yeah, a uh, really good question. Um, the just so we all understand, this was characterized as a small business program, and it is that, 
But having run a nonprofit myself, I always hasten to uh, point out that nonprofits are small businesses as well. And we fought very hard to make sure nonprofits qualify for the Paycheck Protection Program. So um, you, it's easier if you have an existing relationship with a, with a local bank. Um, but I would go right to your bank and see whether you qualify and get in line. Um, this is one of those things, it's like voting or anything else, where if, you, if, you, if you're in line and you stay in line, you're probably entitled to whatever your position in a, and is. And as long as we keep appropriating funds to this program, um, it behooves you to jump into this line and make sure you um, uh, submit your application. And if you decide in the end that it's not right for your, your organization or your agency, there's no requirement that you draw down on the funds. But it is extremely, extremely generous. I mean, just to be clear, it covers your entire operating budget. That's salary, that's utilities, that's all of it. Uh, for eight weeks as a very low interest loan. And then at the end of the eight weeks, as long as you can submit to this, the Small Business Administration proof that you use the money for uh, keeping your, your company alive, um, then that loan is forgiven. So it's two months worth of operating and it's definitely worth pursuing. Now, my end of the bargain, our end of the bargain is to get more money into the program because we do think it's gonna be depleted by the end of the week. But I do think, um, we will whether we replenish the funds you know this thursday or two thursdays from now it's worth getting into line thank you thank you senator um a big part of also the work that we do is around um, food security and food access so working with um, different um, stakeholders different community-based organizations to make sure that people have access to the food we need so um, can you talk a little bit about your work in this area and the additional advocacy that's needed? Um, you know, we, we saw um, how you've been um, voicing out the need for also farmers. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, a couple of thoughts on the federal level, and then if you if you if if you'll indulge me, I'll give a couple of thoughts on the local level, although it's technically not my kuleana. Um, on the federal level, we did a couple of things. There was money for SNAP, but frankly, not enough. But we did widen the eligibility aperture because we, we don't want to have, you know, means testing may have its place um, under normal circumstances. But right now, um, we really want to open up the aperture and also not assume that just because you weren't um, in a financially difficult decision, uh, position last year, that, that, you, you know, you, uh, that you're okay now. And so the eligibility requirements were loosened up for SNAP. Um, and then there's money for um, uh, I believe it's called TFAP, which is money that ends up in, in your um, county-based uh, food banks. And then there's some USDA loan programs, which are relatively generous. Uh, my own judgment is that uh, over the next six to 10 weeks, we are looking at a kind of confluence of problems, but maybe that present a certain kind of opportunity. We have restaurants that are tanking. We have farmers that have basically lost a market. Um, and we have people who are potentially going hungry, but we also have a lot of federal money um, uh, moving through um, our state over the next six to 10 weeks. So one thing that states are really considering doing is setting up buying programs for takeout meals for certain restaurants, uh, or even considering buying up and then freezing um, certain uh, uh, farm products to be used in the DOE or the prisons or for the broader community. So that's something that I know um, uh, Representative uh, Sylvia Luke and others are kind of considering um, how they would go about configuring that, but we do have a potential opportunity to go ahead and feed our people with our own food uh, and with federal money. Yeah, yeah I think we, we have been in conversation too, how we can assist um, you know, the Department of Agriculture, but also some of our farmers that have lost um, some revenue due to the, the sh various shutdowns. Um, there is some oversupply and how we can best utilize that to continue um, with meal distribution um, and continue to keep, keep, keep income coming in for farmers um, would be great. Um, we also wanted to be able to um, talk about any assistance for um, renters and homeowners? Um, 
are you able to t talk about that and any kind of um, forbearance that's happening with, and um, any resources available for folks? Yeah, so here was the fight um, in the Congress. We wanted um, not just forbearance, um, but, but um, to essentially waive rent and mortgage for individuals. We did not win that battle, but we got forbearance. And just to be totally precise, because forbearance is not a word most people are familiar with. Even I had to clarify what it meant, even though I'm in the government. Forbearance means you don't have to pay now. It does not mean you never have to pay. So it's basically a break on paying your rent or your mortgage when it's due, but you still owe the money. And I think that is some measure of relief. But remember that when the economy recovers and the forbearance is gone, you may have three or four months worth of mortgage or rent to pay. So what we are doing is fighting in the next COVID package um, to basically cover that back end payment, especially for lower income individuals. Um, there may be some people who are able to uh, cover that, but for a lot of folks, it's gonna be just a time bomb um, uh, waiting for them in the fall. So that's something that Sherrod Brown, a good friend of mine, the top uh, Democrat on the Banking, uh, uh, Housing and Urban Development Committee, uh, and I are fighting for in the next package. Um, whether or not, and then just backing up for Hawaii people, you, you know, I would just not assume um, anything about whether or not any individual you know is eligible for forbearance. I think most people are assuming that unless they're in public housing or some kind of subsidized housing situation, that they're not eligible. Um, we think that the way the law works 60, 65% of all <clears throat> renters and mortgage holders are eligible for forbearance um, because of the way we uh, constructed this law. So, you know, you don't have to be a normally low income individual uh, to be eligible for forbearance, for forbearance. Here's the problem. I can't tell each individual whether they're eligible or not. The only way you can figure this out is you got to call your mortgage servicer uh, in the case of your, uh, if you're a homeowner, or uh, either your landlord, if you have a reasonable relationship with your landlord, or one of the HUD housing counselors who can tell you whether or not you're eligible. And it's kind of technical, but the point is 60 to 70% of people in Hawaii are eligible for this forbearance. And so if you need it, you should take it up. Certainly if you don't need it, it probably makes sense to pay uh, everything on time um, so you don't end up uh, in arrears uh, in three or four months. Thank you, Senator. Um, we still have a few minutes left, but I think as a follow-up to that, as folks are experiencing various challenges with the different state entities, like you know, financial institutions, unemployment, how and 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 either getting rejections on el eligibility or additional challenges, like is there a, a is there a lead um, on who folks can submit kind of these requests to or feedback to? Um, you know, as the, the public is, um, is getting a lot of information, but where is there a central resource for folks to be able to submit kind of these questions to? Well, there's a couple of things. First, if you're having a sort of customer service level problem with the State Department, um, you know, um, uh, we've got to work these out. Um, and I think Department of Labor and Industrial Relations is really a bottleneck right now. And I know the director's working really hard on ramping up capacity, but we just have to allow people from other departments uh, to help because they actually literally want to help. And we're now sort of stuck in this bureaucratic thicket where people have to do, you know, move from an equivalent position to an equivalent position and get training and all this. And sure, all that's important. But right now, people are in danger of um, losing their home and certainly in danger of not being able to feed their families. So um, there's got to be a sense of urgency to make sure we process the UI claims in particular. Um, I would just say, generally speaking, our office is here to help. Uh, go to shots.senate.gov, and we'll try to do our very, very best to um, provide um, guidance on what the right agency is to call. Uh, we'll be your advocate where it's appropriate, uh, usually where it's federal. Um, but one of the things that my office did that I'm frankly most proud of this year is as soon as the bill passed, they were working day and night, and I really mean it, day and night, um, mm -hmm. for about five straight days over the weekend. And we developed these fact sheets to describe each part of the bill 
and it's pretty straightforward. You just go to our website and click on the fact sheet and you'll kind of be able to understand whether or not you're likely to be eligible or someone you know is eligible um, for the resources in the CARES Act. In fact, it, just to brag on my staff, it was so good that uh, a bunch of my colleagues ended up using the information we compiled in places like New Jersey and Arizona. So it's really good information. And I normally wouldn't just send people to a fact sheet, but they are that good. So um, take advantage of them. Yes, I think um, I can attest to that as HiFi, we've been sharing those resources um, broadly as well. So thank you to your staff um, for putting those together. Um, I think as kind of parting thoughts, we are already beginning, uh, the state's already beginning and having conversations about reopening our economy, reopening the state. Um, and it's going to affect um, our the broader community as the public would want to feel safe and feel that they can trust the environments that they're in to be able to go back to school or go back to church or go, you know, have congregate again. And so what would be kind of the, what are your thoughts on that and what should we do as a community um, to help our, to help prepare for that? Uh, it's a really good question and it's a conversation we're going to have to have as a community. I think everybody recognizes that we're in a, uh, intense and unique situation right now as we try to flatten the curve uh, and absorb um, whatever coronavirus uh, uh, does to the state of Hawaii and to uh, everybody who lives here. But there's also a recognition that we can't live like this forever, right? Mm -hmm. um, does that mean we should open right back up on May 15th? No, it doesn't. But it does mean that we should start to consider as conditions improve you know, what aperture should we open up and at what time? Um, and my own judgment is that it should be based on science and data and a balance of things, right? Because um, although we have a singular objective right now of driving down COVID uh, cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, um, there are other um, healthcare issues um, that are rising as a result of us aggressively flattening the curve. So some of those equities really have to be considered over the next, I would say, three to six weeks and then three to six months. So we just have to be planful and thoughtful. Um, in a lot of ways, stumbling into shutting everything down, um, although it sort of looked chaotic, was the easy part because all we had to do was land on the most um, obviously scientifically right position. And we landed there and it looks like it's working. So that part, although it was clunky, to me was a little easier than the really challenging question of in an island state, um, what do we open and when? How do we measure whether uh, what we're doing is working? I know there are a lot of very smart and thoughtful people kind of uh, making sure that we do this planfully, uh, and I'm confident we will. Whether that happens in May, June, July, or October, I think depends entirely on conditions, um, but I'm trying to participate in that process to make sure that um, there's a community consensus and um, nobody feels like they were left out of this particular conversation because it really, the, the, for the most part, everybody's been outstanding in social distancing and taking care of each other. And, the, and we really owe it to each other to, when we come out of this, um, sort of lock arms and do that together as well. Thank you so much, Senator. And I would like to echo too on the state level we work with a lot of really amazing, wonderful partners who um, can act as that resource. And we're happy to work with your office and our state leadership um, in developing you know, these, these recommendations and plans. Um, for folks on the, um, on the webinar, we were, we're continuing to accept questions. And I'll be working, we'll be working with Senator's office to be able to collect all these questions and answer, get them answered. And then we'll be uploading that um, onto our website. Um, and so stay tuned for that. But um, we wanna, again, wish um, Senator, you know, big thank you for all the work that you're doing. Please continue to fight um, for, not just for our state, but for the rest of the nation as we um, continue to uh, mitigate um, COVID. Um, but thank you, Senator. I know you have to jump off um, and then we'll be transitioning to our next speaker. Thanks guys. Okay. 
So our next speaker will be um, Kathleen Algar from the Hawaii Children's Action Network. Um, are you on yet, Kathleen? Okay, perfect. Hi. Okay. Hi. So um, I know that um, Senator covered a lot of <laughs> a lot of different topics, but um, Kathleen will help provide um, and structure these into the different packages too. She'll also kind of talk a little bit about eligibility because we didn't um, go into detail on that through unemployment and paid family and sick leave. Um, so go ahead, um, Kathleen, but we'll have the last 10 minutes for, um, for questions for Kathleen too. So there might be some things she can help answer. Great, thank you. Um, uh, thank you so much for putting this on. Um, I really enjoyed the information that hi has been sharing um, and everything that's coming out of Senator Shah's office has been really helpful also. Um, I um, am wondering if my PowerPoint um, thank you. Perfect. Okay, so um, so I'm talking uh, about the Family First um, Response Act and the CARES Act and going into a little bit more detail about what does it mean um, for folks locally. Uh, next slide. Uh, to start with, I'm just going to share a little bit about HCAN. So we are a statewide advocacy organization. Our goal is to make sure that kids are safe, healthy, and ready to learn. We can be multiple statewide coalitions like the Working Families Coalition, and we also facilitate the Children's Policy Agenda. That's a list of legislative priorities that um, benefit children and their families. In addition to those, we do some advocacy training throughout the year, and we also have our Parent Leadership Training Institute. Next slide. Um, so we're gonna start by talking about the Family First Response Act, um, which was passed on March 18th and then went into effect on April 1st. Um, so the Family First Act um, kind of uh, laid the groundwork for additional programs. Um, it allowed the state to utilize waivers to make more benefits um, accessible. Uh, one of the um, big things that it did was it mandated that COVID-19 testing must be provided to the consumer at no cost. Um, it also um, helped with some of our SNAP certifications. So if your benefits were set, were set to expire in the next, um, in March, April, May, they've now been extended by um, six months. It also prohibits um, states from disenrolling folks off of their Medicaid. So in Hawaii, if you were a pregnant woman um, uh, after you had your baby, you were um, disenrolled from the program after 60 days. That's no longer the case. Um, so as long as the emergency declaration is still in place, you could still be um, eligible for um, services. Next slide, please. Uh, so this um, chart is difficult to read right now, I know, and it is a lot of information. And um, that's just kind of to show that the topics, the programs that I'm going to be talking about are a lot of, it's a lot of information. And as you can see, there are a lot of different variables that go into it. And so um, my presentations are a little dense and my slides are full of, full of uh, words and uh, just bear with me. Um, thank you. Next slide. Um, so the first that we're going to talk about is the emergency paid sick days program. And so this is a federal program. Um, so existing at the federal level, level uh, not with the, not with the uh, state. And you can use the paid sick days for self-care or to care for a child whose school has been closed or um, child care is closed or other place of care that is closed due to COVID-19. It's 80 hours. There's a max benefit of $511 per day for self and then $200 per day if for care of others. It's for all public employers, private employers with 500 employees or less. And there are some special rules that apply to emergency um, responders and healthcare providers. For this program, if you've worked one day, you're eligible. Uh, next slide. Um, these are the um, qualifying reasons for the emergency paid sick. So you can see the majority are for self-care, um, but also it's a care for an individual who has been diagnosed or with symptoms of COVID-19. Next slide, please. Um, uh, again, it, it's um, all public employers, private 500 or less, including nonprofit organizations. If you are a business with fewer than 50 employees, um, you can get an exemption from providing the care for others, so not the self-care, um, just for like the child's care closure. Um, but you can only get that exemption if you can show that um, providing the benefit would risk the vitality of your business. 
Um, if you are self-employed or a gig economy worker, you are still eligible. Um, and again, it's the um, it's 80 hours of pay six time related to COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please. Um, if you are um, if you are a part-time worker, you're still eligible. There's a special formula that your employer would use to figure out what your um, benefits would be. And when they pass this provision, they also included some worker rights. Uh, so for instance, this sick time um, from Families First is in addition to whatever sick leave your um, employer, uh, you already have accrued with your employer. They cannot make you utilize this sick leave over your um, previously accrued sick leave. There is no schedule or there's nothing that says you have to take one over the other. It's whatever works best for you. Um, you do not have to find a replacement worker. Um, and if you were receiving health insurance before, your health insurance must still be provided. Um, if you are teleworking and receiving pay though, you are not eligible for this program. Um, next slide, thank you. So the um, other provision that Family First um, passed is an expansion of our Family and Medical Leave Act. So this, was, this is the 12 weeks of unpaid leave that's available um, to folks for things like um, bonding uh, for, with a new baby or adoption or caring for a family member with a serious illness. Um, the expansion though under Families First is only for, uh, only to care for children if or other place of care is closed related to COVID-19. Um, it is still the 12 weeks maximum. There was no additional weeks added into this provision. And the first 10 days are unpaid. Um, and that is uh, like, that's because of the paid sick days, you're supposed to kind of utilize them together. It's the same wage replacement as paid sick. So two thirds of your wage or up to um, $200 a day. Uh, the same rules that applied for healthcare providers and emergency responders still apply. Um, and eligibility is a little bit different. So if you are a full-time, part-time temporary employee who had been on the job or rather on the payroll for at least 30 days, you are eligible. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the, uh, again, the, this is a, for all public employers and private employers with fewer than 500, um, including nonprofits. Um, it does waive some of the eligibility requirements that are traditionally um, required under FMLA, like the number of hours um, that you will, would have had to have worked. Next slide, please. Um, you can still claim that exemption if you um, are a business with 50 employees or fewer, but again, it is just if providing the benefit would jeopardize your business um, by viability. Uh, federal workers might not be covered, um, it depends. And there is a little bit of flexibility if you were laid off and then rehired. Um, and so we would encourage you and your employer to check with the Department of Labor. Um, Self-employed are all also eligible. However, um, that 12 weeks is it. So if you had exhausted your FMLA previously, you're not eligible. Um, and in addition, if you are currently using FMLA for other purposes and then would want to um, switch because this is now applicable, um, you once those 12 weeks are gone, um, that's that's it. You're not you're not able. Um, next slide, please. So the um, job protection for this is also a little bit different. Um, FMLA um, uh, already had the job restoration right, um, except for, uh, for businesses with less than 25 employees under certain conditions. Um, and your, um, your rate of pay uh, is gonna be uh, based on your normal schedule. And this, I think it's the same calculation if you were um, part-time. Uh, next slide. So this is, um, I apologize, I did not make my slides Zoom compatible. Um, so uh, these are the special rules. Uh, when the Family First Act was passed, it just said healthcare provider and emergency responder. And then later the Department of Labor issued just some technical guidance that um, defined what those terms meant. And they made it really broad and expansive in a way I don't think um, the uh, sponsors of the legislation had originally intended. Um, so for instance, um, healthcare provider goes beyond just doctor nurse to anyone employed at a doctor's office, hospital, healthcare center. Um, and so that includes a whole range of people that um, now may not be 
eligible. Additionally, emergency responder, um, it's similar in that it goes just beyond your military law enforcement, um, emergency medical services, and says that it's also for individuals who work um, at these places and whose work is necessary to maintain the operations of the facilities. And so there is some concern that um, folks are going to be um, ineligible because of these broad definitions. And uh, we're hopeful that when there is a fourth bill that they kind of go in and correct some of these um, issues so that uh, folks that need to take these um, benefits are able to. Uh, next slide, please. Um, for this, because it is a federal program, the enforcement is just through the Federal Department of Labor. And so they have an email address that they have put together um, for you to email if you're having any issue, issues accessing this benefit um, or the FMLA benefit. Um, right now, we are in their non-enforcement period, which means that if you um, have applied, if you've asked, you wanted to take, like use the paid sick leave benefit and your employer, employer denied you um, and you didn't fall into one of the special categories. Um, right now, DOL probably wouldn't bring any enforcement actions against your employer if they said they were going to fix it. But after April 17th, that won't necessarily be the case. Um, so we encourage folks, if you're having access, if you're having trouble accessing these benefits, to please let DOL know. Uh, and both of these programs expire on December 31st, um, 2020. It's a hard stop. And just as an FYI, um, these programs are totally refundable, fully refundable from the federal government. Um, your employer would claim a tax credit to refund the cost of providing the benefit. Um, next slide, please. So uh, Senator Schatz talked a little bit about the CARES Act. Um, you know, this was, uh, unprecedented legislation, over $2 trillion, with Hawaii getting over $1.25 billion. Um, it saw, um, you know, uh, it's a lot of money. Um, they, ex um, it's, you know, giving a lot of monetary benefits to households. Um, as Senator Schatz mentioned, the stimulus checks are due this week, or today rather. Um, it also provided the Paycheck Protection Program for small businesses, and then it expanded unemployment insurance um, with three different programs that all have very similar acronyms. Um, so thank you. Uh, for, for that. Uh, next slide. So the stimulus checks are based off of earnings, so they are contested <laughs> a little bit. Um, the information's on the slides as to um, what you would qualify for. So the economic impact payment, uh, as it's called, is up to $1,200 for an individual or $24 if you're married filing jointly. Um, if you earn less than uh, that number in the categories, you're eligible for the full amount. If you earn more but less than um, the next uh, bracket, you're still eligible for some payment. In addition, if you had a child that you claimed on a tax uh, previous tax form, you are eligible for 500 per child. Um, if you don't typically file taxes, you're still eligible for this benefit. Um, uh, it, you might just have to take an additional step um, that we'll get to, I think, on the next slide. Um, so if you filed a tax return in 2019 or 2018, um, then you don't have to do anything. If you've already linked your accounts, if they did a direct deposit, you're good to go, and I believe you'll be the first ones to receive your money. Um, if you don't typically file a return, like Social Security, um, or you don't earn enough to file a return, um, they, you're still eligible. You just have to take some additional steps. Um, on the next slide, um, uh, there is, um, the IRS has created a tool. It's called Do I Need to File a Tax Return? Um, on their website, and so you can um, go through it and see if you do. Uh, additionally, if you do not, they have an application for you to enter your information so that you're still eligible um, to get uh, to get your payments, to get your stimulus checks. Um, next slide, please. So uh, Senator Schatz talked about this a little bit. There were just a couple of pieces that I wanted to reiterate, and that is that for the Paycheck Protection Plan, it includes nonprofits, sole proprietors, independent contractors, and self-employed persons. Um, we know that local businesses are taking advantage of this, and that's fantastic because this money um, is just a pot of money, and once it runs out, um, that's it. Next slide, please. 
Uh, as Senator Schott said, it is primarily, I mean, the purpose of it is to keep people on the payroll. Um, and so that's where the majority of the money has to be spent. Uh, if you utilize it for the required reasons, um, your loan can be forgivable. And you apply directly through a lender. And so on my slide, I have a link um, that lists all the Hawaii vendors. Additionally, you can go to sba.gov and get that link as well. The CARES Act also created another program, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. That one is not forgivable, and that pot of money has already run out, so we're not going to talk about it. Um, next slide. So for the expanded unemployment um, insurance benefits, um, the three programs that they talked about, uh, the first, or they, they created, the first is the Pandemic Unemployment Compensation, or PUC. So this is the additional $600 per week that you're going to get. It's a flat amount. So whether you were a part-time worker, full-time worker, everybody's getting it, and it ends on July 31st. And there's a non-reduction rule, which means that the state cannot reduce the amount of money that you're getting because you're getting this additional benefit. Uh, additionally, folks will also soon see um, uh, additional weeks for benefits through the pandemic emergency unemployment compensation. So that is providing an additional 13 weeks for workers after you've exhausted your unemployment insurance. So in Hawaii, we get 26 weeks. So an additional 13 would take us to 39. And those benefits are at the same level, nothing changes. Um, and it's available for the rest of 2020, which I think is pretty close to the 39 weeks um, uh, so it should take you to the end of the year. If you had previously exhausted your unemployment benefits, you can reapply um, to be eligible eligible for um, PEUC when it becomes uh, when it goes online. Next slide, please. Um, for PUA, this is the catch-all for folks who don't traditionally qualify for our state unemployment insurance. So, like our self-employed um, folks that don't have the work history, uh, they would qualify for this program. Um, it's the same benefit levels, it's the same 39 weeks, and you would also get the same $600. If you are teleworking um, with pay, you do not qualify for unemployment. In addition, um, if you are getting the paid sick or the paid family leave benefit, uh, you would not qualify for unemployment. Uh, but just in general, you can only utilize one of those benefits at a time. So um, if you're getting paid sick, you're not eligible for anything else in that moment. Uh, next slide, please. Um, these are all the reasons why you would be eligible for PUA. It does talk about providing care for a child or other household member who can't attend school because of COVID-19, um, because of a quarantine, um, because your place employment has closed. And at the very end, they listed um, other criteria established by the Secretary of Labor. That just gives the federal government a little wiggle room if they needed to go in and add an additional reason um, later on that wasn't previously covered. They don't have to pass new legislation for this. They can just add it into the definitions. Next slide, please. Um, so we don't know how it's going to play out yet um, when it comes to applying for a PUA. The system is not um, up and running yet, but what we've heard and what we are hopeful is that everyone would still just submit your one claim, and then you would either be, um, if you qualify for state unemployment, you get that, and then you would get your 600 and the additional 13 weeks, and if you don't qualify for state employment, it would just kick you over to PUA, where you would also be eligible for the 600 and the additional 13 weeks. Next slide. Uh, just this week, the director of DLIR kind of gave a timeline of when we can see these additional benefits. Um, so folks may start seeing the $600 uh, next Wednesday if they're already receiving unemployment. Um, the 13 additional weeks should be ready to go by the end of April and PUA should be ready by May. Um, all of these programs can be backdated though. So it's from when you first filed your claim of unemployment or when you first became unemployed uh, that, that it's eligible. Um, if you are applying for unemployment, I, uh, we have all seen that it's backlog. There's a lot of people waiting, not getting confirmation. We know that it is taking a lot of time right now. Um, and Senator Schatz's point, I think that DLIR is trying really hard to move through it as quickly as possible. On their website, they have provided 
uh, FAQs, videos, emails for literally everything. They are trying to make it as simplified as possible. There are still a lot of problems that we know that. If you need assistance in filling out your unemployment as, um, uh, claim, Legal Aid Society of Hawaii is still doing their hotline numbers, so they're not taking walk-ins. Um, they still have their hotline available. They can help folks specifically, um, focus citizens, people with limited English proficiency, or if you don't have access to the technology because DLIR is pushing so many people to apply online. So they have their Oahu number and then also their neighbor islands number. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is just an example of one of the FAQs that DLIR has put together. Um, and it just talks about, um, uh, kind of walks you through the process. What am I eligible for? Uh, next slide. And then this was on their Twitter the other day that this section seems to be tripping a lot of people up if when you're applying for your claim that you want to make sure that you give your um, bank information correctly. So just pay special attention to those numbers. Uh, next slide. And then in addition to the local resources, there are some uh, national resources like Family Values at Work that can help you decide what you may be eligible for. So they have a um, Know Your Rights section to figure out, um, based on the information you provide, what programs you may be eligible for. Next slide. Uh, this is the lovely flow chart that should make a little bit more sense now. We will make sure that you get a copy of this so that you can read all the information. Um, I know it is a, it's, a, it's just a lot of information. And in addition, I would just like to say that um, guidance is still being issued on all of these recently developed programs. And so things are still changing. They're still in flux. Um, uh, and so for that reason, um, there's a, it's not easy to say definitively, yes, you're eligible or no you're not. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in addition to um, DLIR and DHS, the Medical Legal Partnership can also help if you have questions around um, other benefits like SNAP or general assistance. So they have um, created really uh, helpful informational um, or some info sheets um, and some uh, little graphics on their website. I would encourage folks to check it out. Next slide. And just yesterday, DHS um, provided some really important information around child care. Um, so they were able to utilize some federal waivers to do things like lifting the monthly gross income, uh, eliminating the activity requirement, and some of the family co-pays. If you are an essential worker and you are still going to work and you're, um, you know, uh, you need care for your child, DHS actually has a list of um, essential providers or providers for essential workers uh, on the next slide. Um, uh, Patch has it, my um, slide links to it. In addition, Patch and EOEL both uh, have access to that list. And I would just encourage folks um, as you need information to go check it out. Um, on my last slide, um, we have information for DLIR, um, I'm sure everybody knows their phone numbers, email addresses, in addition to DHS. And then HKN actually has a resource map that includes things like child care, food, shelter, and screening sites. Uh, so I apologize because that probably went a little bit over my time. It's just a lot of information. I'm happy to answer questions. I would just like to um, preface it by saying that because this information is changing, if I am not 100% certain of my answer, I would prefer to take the question and get back to you so that I am not giving incorrect information. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. That's a lot of information that you're able to condense um, in a short amount of time, but we will provide the slides to participants. I think um, we're, we're going to have time for a couple quick questions. The first is around um, the stimulus checks. So um, granted that a lot of the folks who were unemployed um, lost um, their income in 2020. So what does it mean for people who experienced a reduction in pay in 2020, but um, would, wouldn't have qualified for the stimulus checks when they filed for their 2019 um, tax return because they, they would still have had um, income in 2019? And do you know if they should go ahead and file um, a tax return anyway? Um, so if you, if they had already filed a tax return, um, then that's the information that they're going to use. Uh, if they lost it in 2020, um, they would still be using the uh, income eligibility from 2019. I think this also goes to if you had a child in 2019 and you hadn't filed yet, 
Um, I had asked if um, payments could be retroactive. Um, for instance, I had a kid in 2019. I have not filed my tax returns yet. Uh, would I be eligible for that 500 or are they gonna pull for my 2018? And I have not received any kind of guidance around that. Um, I haven't seen um, uh, I haven't seen any information. So I would assume though that they, in order to get the money out as quickly as possible, they're just gonna pull from the information they have. Um, but I would check with I, I would check the IRS's website specifically um, for that question. Thank you, thank you, Kathleen. Um, are you able to? Um, I'm looking at the questions. Um, okay, for folks um, in Hawaii, a lot of there's still some folks who don't have a checking account. So, um, what is the advice for folks um, so that they can get that stimulus check? Um, automatically deposited um, and as well as for folks who are applying for unemployment and um, claims. So they can still, both the IRS and DIR can both still cut paper checks. It just delays the, it just delays when you would get them. So for instance, for the stimulus checks, my understanding is that they were going to go, the first folks that were going to see it were the ones that had that linkage that Senator Schatz had talked about between their bank account um, and the IRS pre-existing. Um, and then if you went in and you entered your filing information, like if you were to um, uh, get a bank account, you could go online and you could enter that information that might speed up your process. Uh, it's just, you, you are still totally able to get um, a paper check. It's just gonna delay when, when you would receive it. Mm -hmm. And just reiterating, right, um, anyone can be eligible for a stimulus check if you meet income requirements, but also for non-filers, so people who have retired, people who receive mm -hmm. social security, um, but have not typically filed for um, a tax return, as long as somebody has a social security number, um, is that correct, Kathleen? Yes, and that actually, yes, and I'm so sorry, I forgot to say this. Um, the uh, For um, the um, unemployment, uh, for the unemployment programs, um, the one group of people that is not qualified, that do not qualify for that are undocumented workers. Um, and so that was a major hole in the federal legislation that we're hoping to correct um, in the fourth bill or um, that the state takes some action on. Um, but they are the one group that doesn't qualify. But yes, even if you don't file a tax return, um, as long as you have social security number, um, you can go onto the IRS's website and enter your uh, information as a non-filer to receive the stimulus check. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then and the last question is for this, for DLIR, I know folks who are filing for claims, they recently put up a tool on their website to find out the status, what the status of your claim is, because there's a huge backlog. But would, what, what is your advice for folks to continue to provide uh, or continue to file for claims or they, should they just continue um, and then who haven't received their checks yet, um, should they just continue filing um, and then I guess yes. I know they're inundated if with you, calls, but yeah. Yeah, so, um, so in some other states for the expansion, the federally expanded programs, um, they were calling for people to hold off. So um, especially for the PUA, like for the uh, gig economy workers or self-employed, they were asking folks not to apply yet until their system was stood up. I haven't seen anything from DLIR that said that for us. So I would um, just have folks, you know, uh, because the process to apply is so lengthy, I would just encourage um, people to apply. Uh, and me saying that though, if DLIR now comes out and says don't apply, we will make sure to share that information uh, with the people um, watching. Okay, um, I think we're gonna wrap up. There are some questions we weren't able to get to, but we'll make sure to work on um, all the questions, including the ones from Senator earlier. But I'll go ahead and transition back to Steph to provide some closing remarks and announcements. Great, thank you so much, Trish. Um, I wanna thank our guests today, Senator Schatz and Kathleen for taking time out of their busy schedules to join us today. Thank you to all of the participants that joined on Zoom. Thank you to the Hi-Fi staff behind the scenes, making sure that this webinar runs smoothly. Um, please mark your calendars for next week's webinar, Wednesday, April 22nd at 12.30 p.m. Based on survey results, we will be joined by Angie Mercado from the Hawaii State Coalition Against Domestic Violence.
and the topic will be unsafe at home, how to help someone who is being abused at home during the stay at home orders. We want to say thank you again for joining us today and hope to see you next week. Aloha.